Hi! Welcome to another lecture video of Math 21. In this video, we will talk about rectilinear motion revisited and antiderivatives involving logarithmic and exponential functions. For this video, we will only talk about the first two topics while the last two topics will be discussed in the second video. So let's get on with the first topic, which is particular antiderivatives in rectilinear motion. So recall our lesson in rectilinear motion in lecture 3.3. Suppose a particle is moving along a line with position function s of t. We know that it's easy to get the velocity and acceleration function by simply differentiating your position function s. So for example, to get velocity, you differentiate s, and to get acceleration, you differentiate velocity. But this time, we are interested in anti-differentiation. So instead of starting with the position function s, we will now start with the acceleration function a. And to get v, we will anti-differentiate a. Then, to get s, we will anti-differentiate v. In particular, s is a particular antiderivative of v, and v is a particular antiderivative of a. So, recall our lesson in particular antiderivatives in lecture 4.1. We know that uh, the number of times that you anti-differentiate will be also be the number of initial conditions that you have in your problem. So let's uh, use this uh, fact in our next examples. So here is our first example. So a heavy projectile is fired straight up from a platform three meters above the ground with an initial velocity of 160 meters per second. Find an equation of motion of the particle. Use negative 10 meters per second square for acceleration due to gravity. So what we want to find is the position function of the particle. And we are given the acceleration of the particle which is due to gravity. So, let's first write our given, which is acceleration function equals negative 10. So, take note that our acceleration due to gravity will be negative by convention. So, we have here negative 10. So, what we want is to get the position function. So, from A, then we must anti-differentiate to get V. So, anti-differentiating negative 10 gives us... Uh, integral of negative 10 dt. So this is with respect to time. Okay, So this will now be our velocity. Uh, so what is the integral of negative 10 dt? That is just, so this, since this is constant, then you will just have negative 10 t plus c. So remember that v is a particular antiderivative of, uh, I mean, yeah, B is a particular antiderivative of A. So that means, uh, since it's a particular antiderivative, your constant C here must be a particular value as well. So how do we solve for this value of C? So to solve for the value of C, we must look for an initial condition in your problem. So that involves hopefully your velocity. So can you find uh, an initial condition here involving velocity? Aha, uh -huh, this one. So it says here that your object has an initial velocity of 160 meters per second. So what does initial mean? It means at time zero. So that means V of zero is 160. So if we plug in V of zero here, then at time t equals 0, this will be t equals 0, 0 times 10 is 0. And then v of 0 is 160, so this will be replaced by 160. Therefore, we will have 160 equals c. Okay? So therefore, c equals 160, and we can replace c here 
with our 160, making the velocity function this one. So this is our velocity function. But we are not yet done. We want the position function. So we write the velocity and again anti-differentiate to get s, okay? the position function. So what is the antiderivative of this one with respect to time t? Then this will be, so using our um, anti-differentiation rules on sums, then we have negative 5t squared plus 160t plus the constant c again. So uh, is this our final answer? No, not yet. Why? Because we want, again, c to be a particular value. So, again, we look at our problem and find an initial condition involving uh, s. Okay? So, in this case, we have... So, we already used uh, initial velocity. Now, we can use uh, this phrase here. It says that the object was fired straight up from a platform 3 meters above the ground. So, this tells us the position of the object at the start of the problem, meaning at time 0 or the initial position. So, that will be S of 0 equals, so what is this position? Uh, if the ground is 0, then 3 meters above the ground, when we say above the ground, then that is a positive number. So, that means uh, this will be positive 3. So, the initial position of the object is positive 3, or in symbols, we write that as s of 0 equals 3. So, when we substitute that to our equation here, t time equals 0, then we, we have here 0, 0, and then here s of 0 is 3, so you'll have c equals 3. Therefore, when we substitute that to our c, then we get the position function of our object. And that is the final answer. So let's go to another example. So in this case, again, the acceleration is given, and it's again a polynomial. Next, we want to find the equation of motion of the particle if the particle is one unit to the right of the origin when t equals 0, and three units to the left of the origin when t equals 2. So again, from acceleration, we want to get the position function. So, how many times are we going to anti-differentiate? We will anti-differentiate how many times? Two times. That's correct. And then, if uh, we will anti-differentiate two times, how many initial conditions must we find in our problem? That's right. We also need two conditions. Okay. So, let's start by writing down their acceleration and uh, anti-differentiating that to get v. Okay? So the antiderivative of this uh, t squared plus 2t will just be t cubed over 3 plus t squared plus constant c. But we will call this c1 to signify that this constant is for the first anti-differentiation. Because remember, we will anti-differentiate two times. So this c1 is for the first anti-differentiation. So, what do you see here? Uh, we have to solve for C1. And uh, can you find an initial condition in the problem that involves velocity? So, unfortunately, our conditions here are all about positions. It says to the right of the origin and to the left of the origin. So, there's nothing about velocity. So, that means we have no initial condition involving velocity. So what do we do? So I guess we have no choice but to continue with our anti-differentiation. So we anti-differentiate our velocity so that we can get position S. So anti-differentiate, then we will get t to the 4 over 12 plus t cubed over 3 plus, remember, c1 is just a constant. So what is the antiderivative of C1 with respect to time t? Then that will just be C1 times t. Okay? So it's just constant times t. Then, uh, don't forget, you have to add an, a new constant of integration. So plus C2. So this C2, 
stands for the constant for the second anti-differentiation. Okay? So now, uh, is this the final answer? Not yet. Because we want to find the values of C1 and C2 first using the two initial conditions that are found in our problem. So we see here that there are two conditions related to position. So we will use both of them to solve for C1 and C2. So, uh, where is the first condition? This one. The particle is one unit to the right of the origin when t equals zero. So, when time equals zero, uh, what do you mean by right of the origin? If the origin is your zero, then the positions to the right of the origin are positive. So, here, one unit to the right of the origin means it's plus one. So, that means s of zero equals one. And if you substitute this in our, uh, so far in our equation, then S of 0 equals 1, this will be 1. And then since this is just a polynomial, it's very easy. You will just have 0 plus 0 plus. So how about this one? This is time equals 0 is 0 times C1. But C1 is a constant. So what is constant times 0? That is just 0. So you will just be left with C2 on the right side, and on the left side, you have 1. Therefore, C2 equals 1. So, we have solved for C2 already. How about C1? Then, we will just use the second condition. So, here, you have 3 units to the left of the origin when T equals 2. So, when you say left of the origin, then that means you have a negative number. So, S of 2 will be negative 3. And then, um, substitute that in our s of t, okay, then we will have this. s of 2 is negative 3. Time equals 2. So t equals 2 here. So you will have t to the 4 over 12, t cube over 3. So that's 8 over 3. And then 2 times c1 and then plus c2, where c2 can be substituted with 1 already from our computation. So, C1 is the only thing left unknown. We can solve for that, and we will get C1 equals negative 4. So, we plug in C1 and C2 values in our S of T, and therefore, this is now our final answer. The uh, particular, uh, no, the, the position function of the particle. So, let's now move on to the second part of our the second topic for this video so antiderivatives yielding logarithmic functions so recall we have this formula from our first lecture on anti-differentiation this is the power rule and uh, what do you remember from this one uh, remember that uh, this is only true when n is not equal to negative 1 okay so, what happens when n equals negative 1? When n equals negative 1, then we will get u raised to the negative 1, or in other words, we have 1 over u. So, for this one, we have a different formula. So, it's not this anymore. Why? Because if n equals negative 1, then the denominator becomes 0, and of course, that is not possible. So, what is this new formula? The formula is ln of absolute value of u plus c. So why is this true? It's easy to check that this is true by simply doing differentiation. So you just differentiate the right-hand side, and you should get 1 over u. And it, uh, indeed, uh, what is the derivative of ln of absolute value of u? It is 1 over u. And therefore, this is um, correct. So, uh, what do we do with a new formula for anti-differentiation? Uh, you just have to remember that this will be part of your arsenal of formulas. Okay? So uh, remember that uh, our technique of substitution relies on you, uh, I mean, relies on uh, choosing an appropriate you. Okay? So, whenever you get a new formula for anti-differentiation, 
you uh, the possible choices for you becomes you know it it increases so dumadami yung possible choices nyo for you so for example in this formula what is the possible value for you uh, uh, before uh, if this is not you this is actually x right the the simplest form of this is x to the n dx but if it's not x anymore it's something else then you let u equals the inner function so in this formula the possible choice for u is the inner function inside the power n but for this formula it says here that you can let u to be the denominator okay so that means if you don't see an inner function you can just let u you can try letting u to be the entire denominator so let's try number one so obviously for this there is no inner function okay so we can let u equals the denominator and that's nice because this is just linear remember when your u is linear there's no problem at all okay so if let u equals 3x plus 2 our du is 3dx therefore uh we can divide by 3 both sides so that you have 1 third du equals dx. Then, we can replace now everything in terms of u and du. So, here, you will have... Uh, so, first, uh, as a rule of thumb, always replace your uh, dx with du. Okay? So, dx will be replaced by 1 third du. So, 6 over 3 will be 2 du. And then, replace the denominator with u. Okay? So, always... Uh, replace uh, you know du first before writing u okay so then you will have this one uh, so what do you do with your constant 2 you can bring that out of the integral so that's 2 times 1 over u integral of 1 over u is ln of absolute value of u so you just get this okay and then finally go back to the original variable x so you will have ln of 3x plus 2 okay and that's the final answer. Again, if you are in doubt of your final answer, you can always differentiate this. And if the derivative is equal to the answer inside the integral, uh, in, equal to the expression inside the integral, then your final answer is correct. Okay? So let's go to the next. So again, our question is, do we let u equals the entire denominator? Or we just let u equals x? Of course not. So is it possible that we can only let u equals log 2x? So which one is the nicer one? Always try to use uh, u that is simple. Okay? So it's not good to choose u equals the entire denominator because this is a product. And when you uh, compute for your du, that will force you to use product rule. And that will give you a very complicated expression, right? And see, uh, here, you don't have anything complicated in the numerator. So you always try to use a simple expression for u. But, but of course, not u equals x, okay? <laughs> So that's completely useless. So let's try let u equals log base 2 of x. So do you remember the derivative of that? So du equals 1 over x or ln 2 dx. And then what do you see? Um, do you see a constant on this side of the equation? Actually, ln 2 is log base e of 2. And that is a constant. So uh, as a rule of thumb, we always um, put the constant on the other side of the equation. So we'll have ln 2 du equals 1 over x dx. So here, 1 over x dx, you try to look for that in the original. Is it there? Yes. So it's 1 over x dx is here. We can replace that, therefore, with ln 2 du. Then after replacing du, we replace with u. So here, 1 over u, okay? Then, therefore, we will have 1 over u du and uh, times ln 2. But ln 2 is constant, so you can bring that out of the integral. 
Okay? So, what is the formula for this? So, now, this is ln absolute value of u, and then go back to your x, and yes, that's it. Okay. That's the final answer. How about this problem? So, notice um, there is no inner function at all. So, again, can we try to let u equals the denominator? Wow, the denominator is linear. So, as we said before, there seems to be no problem taking u equals linear, right? But, where will the problem lie? If u equals 2x minus 1, du will be 2dx, okay? And then, what happens here? Uh, you will be left, so uh, du equals 2x, that means dx is 1 half du, right? So you can replace this with 1 half du, you can replace this with u, but the numerator will be a problem. It's, it will be very hard to replace this with u because if you have to do that, then that means you have to write this in terms of 2x minus 1 first. And that's very, <laughs> very complicated, very hard. So it seems that the letting u equals denominator is not the way to go. So what do you think should we do for this case? So luckily, you have to notice something. This is x cubed and this is x. So if the degree of the numerator is bigger than the degree of the denominator, what is one thing that we can do to uh, transform this uh, appearance? Yes, so you can use long division. Okay? So you can divide this okay? by long division, then you will get a quotient here plus remainder over divisor. Okay? So you can rewrite this one like this, okay? And what's the nice thing about this form? This form is a sum, right? And what is the rule for sums in anti-differentiation? So, the rule for sums is that uh, you can anti-differentiate each addend individually, right? So, uh, for example, if you group this, these uh, three together, then this is just the normal okay, anti-differentiation. And then plus the other one. Okay, so you can anti-differentiate all of them okay, one by one. So this one is no problem. This is just polynomial. But for this one, what should we do for this one? So now we can let u equals the denominator because it's linear. And then above, you just have a constant. So it's easy. Constant will just go out, right? So that's just 1 over u, but uh, careful, uh, your du is 2dx, so you have 1 half du equals dx. So you will have, what is the constant that will, will go out? You will have 3 and then 1 half, so 3 halves will go out of the integral. Then you'll be left with 1 over u, which is ln of absolute value of u. So uh, for these, uh, this polynomial is very easy, just... Uh, integrate them one by one, one by one, okay? And then plus. So, no need to write plus c yet. Uh, let's just write plus c at the very end, okay? So, 3 halves, okay, ln absolute value of u plus c, okay? All right. And then, just go back to x. Don't forget to go back to x, okay? So, 2x minus 1. And that's the final answer. So, let's go to the next Okay, for this example, again, if you let u equals, uh, so first, there's no inner function. So if you let u equals the denominator, is that a good idea? So first, if u equals x squared plus 2x plus 1, then what is du? Du will be 2x plus 2, or that's 2 times x plus 1, right? Uh, but in the numerator, we don't have x plus 1 we have x minus 1. So, that will be quite a problem. Okay? So, that means we cannot substitute uh, this in terms of du. Okay? And because of that, the substitution fails already. Okay? So, we cannot let u equals the denominator. So, what do we do? So, just like the previous item, we must try to change the appearance of this 
integral. So how do we do that? So maybe one thing you notice, this is a perfect square in the denominator, right? So this is actually the square of x plus 1. So now, since it looks like this, you can now let u equals x plus 1, the inner function. That's nice because this is linear, so du is just actually dx. So in fact, there's no constant that needs to be transferred. Okay? So let's replace du with uh, dx with du, and then, then replace u, uh, x plus 1 with u. So you'll have u squared, you have du. So what is the problem now? The question is, how do you replace x minus 1? So do you remember how to do that? Do you remember how to do that? So what we do is here in our let u equals x plus 1, we will just solve for x in terms of u. Okay? So that means you transpose u1 on the other side. So you will get u minus 1 equals x. Okay? So, if you replace x with u minus 1, you will get u minus 1 minus 1, and that gives you u minus 2, okay? So, x minus 1 is just u minus 2, okay? So, everything is in terms of u, no more problem. So, how do we proceed? So, can we just integrate the numerator and the denominator as is? No, okay? Because we don't have that kind of rule we don't have a rule for quotients or products in and unlike in derivatives right there's a product rule there's a quotient rule but in antiderivatives there's none so all we have in antiderivatives is the sum rule so the question is is it possible to write this as a sum yes the answer is yes so how so if your um, form is a plus b over c then you can write it as a over c plus b over c. So you just divide every add end above by the denominator. So here you will have u over u squared is 1 over u, then copy sign minus 2 over u squared. And then this is now a sum. So by the sum rule, we can now anti-differentiate. So what is the, derivat uh, the anti-derivative? Then you will have, uh, so yeah, uh, <laughs> slow motion so uh, mm, separate them as a sum uh, the constant 2 you can bring it out of the integral and then you can <laughs> do it one by one now so here you'll have ln of absolute value of u minus copy 2 and then what's the integral of this one this is u raised to the negative 2 right so that's u raised to the negative 1 over negative 1. So you have to use the power rule, okay? So u to the negative 1 over negative 1. So we will have a double negative that becomes positive, And u to the negative 1 is just 1 over u, okay? So that's it. So don't make the mistake of writing this as ln of u squared. That is totally wrong. <laughs> so that's not the answer. So uh, the ln um, formula is only for... 1 over u. So if you have, uh, say, 1 over u square, 1 over u cube, then all of those will fall under the power rule. Okay? And then don't forget the plus c. Okay? So remember, you always write plus c every time you, fi um, you finish uh, the antiderivative step. Okay? So once you apply the formulas, there's a plus c. Then the last step is just go back to the original variable x. Okay? So here, and this is the final answer. So let's go. Ah, uh, yeah. So uh, that's it for the first part of this lecture video. Uh, I'll see you in the second part where we will tackle the last two topics. So see ya. Bye.